Hi everyone, Happy New Year, and welcome to the podcast. Where can you find the best medical information anytime and anywhere? Right here on the smartest doctor in the room. I'm your host, Dr. Dean Mitchell. I'm very excited as we enter our fourth year of the podcast, and we're soon closing in our in our hundredth episode, which I never even imagined we'd be doing this. In, uh, but I want to thank all my loyal listeners for being part of this really fun journey. Uh, my usual disclaimer, please note that this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not intended as personal medical advice. For that, please consult your trusted healthcare provider. Okay, today, in the past 20 years, there's been an explosion of new innovative treatments in two areas of medicine that were relatively stagnant for many years. One of those areas is allergic diseases, which includes asthma, urticaria or hives, and eczema. The other area has been in autoimmune diseases. Now, the new treatments are called biologics because they work by blocking immune inflammation directly at the cell level in contrast to pharmacological medications that block chemicals in the body that eventually have to be uh, removed through the liver or the kidney. And I'm sure all of you have seen the TV advertisements. They're there all the time. You see men and women jumping into swimming pools in their bathing suits, showing their skin, you know, proud that they no longer have these, you know, embarrassing rashes. Or there's another commercial where there's this young woman in the wild of nature, not afraid to take a deep breath because her asthma is under good control. Well, the big questions that I want to answer today are, are these tra- treatments safe? Are they as effective as they claim they are? And, you know, and how do they compare to existing medications? My guest today, Dr. Olga Bel- Belostatsky, is a board-certified allergist, immunologist, and rheumatologist here in New York City, and I believe affiliated with Lenox Hill Northwell uh, Hospital System. She has extensive experience in using these medications, and I'm hoping to learn along with all of you which are the best ones to use and the benefits of the treatment. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Olga Belostatsky to the podcast. Thank you. Okay. So Dr. Belostatsky, um, first off, I always like to go into people's backgrounds. And I know that you did your medical training in uh, the Soviet Union. Just curious, if you don't mind discussing, what was that like? And I know you've obviously done training here, your fellowship training, I believe at Long Island Jewish Hospital here, uh, which is now again part of Northwell. Um, well, how would you compare some of your training in uh, in Russia compared to here in the United States? Um, it's completely different. Really? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, the system uh, in general was uh, different, but I believe now they have uh, the same uh, multiple choice based uh, education. At the time, it was more uh, personal um person to person examination and uh, uh, everything was based on uh people's capacity to uh, present cases present everything so it was more uh creative in a way but clinically i would say the american system is much richer and much more strict and uh, i learned a lot i'm glad i needed to go through education the second time in my life when i came to this country you know it's funny you say that because uh, i've always been a little bit of a critic of the uh, medical school system here especially the first two years which is basic science in that all these multiple choice questions because Unfortunately, I think it gets the students to kind of just focus on answers and not think outside the box. So I almost like your your uh, system's way of being more personal and creative, honestly. Um, I also, it's interesting, when I, I trained in medical school in Israel, which I really had some terrific doctors there who trained me. And actually, but one of them, the anatomy professor, was from Russia. He had, had immigrated much later in life. He was actually a surgeon there and also an amazing anatomist. And, you know, although there were some communication problems because um, he spoke very little, even Hebrew, 
and I didn't speak any Russian. He was one of the most amazing teachers I had. I mean, you just, the way he could present things. So uh, I was just curious because I know also a lot of times in, in Eastern Europe, you know, they may not always have the resources we have in the United States, but the physicians and the, and the, the doctors, you know, really utilize all their resources, you know, to, to become terrific physicians. So I was just curious about that. Um, Excuse me for interruption. You are right. It, it was much more creative and much more out of box because here it's limited by the uh, number of choices. And there is a, even if it's the end of the alphabet, you can go to the, uh, another alphabet. Okay. And actually, you mentioned Israel. Uh, you know, I uh, prefer... Um, to go to European conferences um, uh, organized by uh, one uh, amazing physician from Israel. His name is Yehud de Schoenfeld. Oh, sure. I've, I've heard, I've seen his articles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, what he did, he organized uh, a, a, an organization. It's called um, uh, Autoimmunity um, um, uh, uh, organiz uh, International Organization. And he um, organizes meetings uh mm. in europe every year and i follow it because uh, he has um similar to my uh, uh, mentality so he organizes them with multi uh, specialty um uh, uh, doc uh, doctors groups mm -hmm. and we learn about autoimmunity from ophthalmology point of view uh, dermatology rheumatology immunology neurology cardiology and so on and so forth and it opens up so much possibilities to oh that. absolutely I, I agree with you 100 percent. it's the whole idea i mean this is one of the things i love about doing the podcast i mean unfortunately too in medicine in the united states sometimes doctors especially in specialties go into their silo where they just stay very closed within their own specialty but it's really through the interconnection of all of the specialties that's one of the parts i like i do a lot of also functional holistic medicine which i end up touching many areas of medicine outside of my specialty in immunology that uh it makes it so interesting and you end up you know finding answers you know it's funny about dr schoenfeld i'm sure you, you may be aware of this his name came across to me because I was doing a research for a book and his name as an author kept coming up because he was one of the original people who I, I believe noted that when you lose sense of smell, anosmia, as you know, it's been associated with autoimmune diseases. And now we know other diseases where people used to kind of think that it was a trivial problem and it's not so trivial. <laughs> so, and obviously we know that from COVID, it's not so trivial. One last question on your background, and then I wanna really get into the meat and potatoes, but how did you end up choosing the specialty of allergy, immunology, and rheumatology when uh, you decided to do your training here? First of all, I decided in, in my childhood because at the time, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> at the time, uh, immunology was the only um precise science so i liked that it's all um based on molecules and cell and uh, cell interactions uh because everything else was just physiology pathophysiology based uh, you know not much measurements uh and just uh, physical measurements like in cardiology have never been right. interesting for me and <clears throat> i thought that uh, immunology gives universal in uh, multi-specialty language for uh, every part of medicine. So that is why I chose uh, our immunology. When I came to this country, I added rheumatology because it speaks the same language. Yeah, it and does. basically, now I have uh, <clears throat> like three or in my practice, it's uh, autoimmunity, uh, immunology, uh, oh, I'm sorry, allergy and uh, immune deficiencies. So mm -hmm. I deal with three the of whole them. spectrum. Yes. yes. So I make people immune deficient. I treat immune deficiencies. Yeah, you, you're getting it both ways. I see that. And, and as you know, too, the original immunologist came from uh, Russia was Eli Meshnikov. I was talking about him in a prior podcast with uh, Dr. Ravella. We were talking about, you know, she was a transplant immunologist, a gastroenterologist. Very interesting. Again, the connection. She was at Columbia for a lot of years. And uh, so, okay, let's get into about biologics. And, you know, a lot of my listeners know, again, you know, I've been practicing 30 years, allergy, immunology, functional medicine. I try to go the holistic or most natural way when I can, but I'm again, always open to using the latest medications. Can you explain 
in the hopefully the best simplest terms for our listeners, what are biologics or monoclonal antibody treatments? How, how are they different than medications like steroids? Um, uh, they are targeting medication. So it's not like when you use a, a classical um, um, medications like anti-inflammatory, it doesn't affect specific molecule. It affects just the pathway right. uh, with multiple uh, <coughs> involved parts. Uh, uh, the same about chemo, uh, old chemo therapy. Uh, right. We use a lot of metrixate, which was uh, probably the first medication which we uh, stole from um, uh, uh, hematology oncology to right. treat uh, patients with rheumatological diseases. Again, it's not targeting. It's uh, the whole spectrum of um, uh, cells um, and uh, which uh, uh, are involved in inflammatory process are getting suppressed and uh, uh, there are lots of side effects um, uh, including bo bone marrow suppression uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I call uh, the era of biologics is uh, molecular terrorism. Mm. It terrorizes one particular molecule and uh, uh, with uh, specific monoclonal antibodies or receptor blockers on the cells, which prevent um, uh, evolution of the whole uh, pathway of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, targeting uh, TNF molecule or some other molecules. Uh, uh, so it's much more effective. Uh, okay. Yeah. So what you're saying is interesting. I never, that's a really good analogy. So to me, you know, again, for the listeners, I guess I'll try to make my, my analogy. You're saying that the older medications, whether it was cortisones, the methotrexates, sort of the chemotherapy agents that got moved over, to, for example, to rheumatological diseases and sometimes used in asthma are kind of like the cluster bombs. They just destroy everything in the, in the region, way. whereas these newer biologics are a little bit more like a drone targeting you know specifically uh an air you know as we know uh, a specific target on cells and hopefully it's a cleaner you know cleaner blockage let's put it that way but these medications this, that's the thing i also want to try to elucidate these new medications they're not pharmacologic drugs they are essentially immune uh produced um treatments correct they're not they're not based in any physiological it's just really all purely through the immune system and they take like either mouse or human cells and they uh, uh, produce um, immunoglobulins that will block the either the cell or we'll get into some specific examples a specific type of immunoglobulin so that it can't bind to cells and release all of those inflammatory molecules is that that's correct. correct way I'm explaining. That's okay. Correct. All right. Let's go into some specific conditions because I think this is important because, you know, one of the key questions I ask myself, I'm sure patients ask themselves are, you know, what's the first, second line of treatment? Like where do these medications come into play? Because there are other options, you know, so it's always a question of which is better. So let's go to asthma for a second. And that's an area that both of you and I specialize in. And, you know, one of the big breakthroughs, really it's amazing now it's almost 20 years ago is um zolaire uh, or the generic term omalizumab very hard to say <laughs> it was the original monoclonal antibody um do you feel that it's lived up to its promise in controlling allergic asthma and my multi-part question is um do you think it's more effective than the other options, such as inhaled steroids? So again, how do you choose to put a patient on Zolaire in your practice versus just using inhalers or like a leukotriene antagonist, like single um, antelucast, that kind of thing? Uh, first, I maximize all uh, traditional treatment, co conventional uh, okay. treatment for asthma. And... Um, then I decide on the uh, biologic. So, uh, frankly, at present, I practically don't use it uh, for asthma. You don't feel like you need because, to in uh, many cases. Because we have much more newer medications. 
Uh, newer yeah, medications. Uh, biologic, uh, biologic drugs. Like okay, wait, wait. I just want to clarify this. So, okay, so yeah, Zolari is one of the older ones. There are obviously, we, and as you and I both know, there are, which was made a huge difference in asthma care. I mean, it was probably one of the biggest breakthroughs in asthma care was the inhaled steroids and the combined inhaled steroids with long-acting bronchodilators. I mean, it was really a game changer. I mean, people that had to live on oral prednisone, you know, from you know asthma exacerbation to asthma exacerbation were now being fully controlled. And there was a claim for a while that it was actually reversing and blocking long-term uh disease in the lungs, which again, there's been some controversy whether that's true or not. So you're saying that um, you like biologics for asthma in certain cases, but actually you like some of the newer ones. So I'm sorry, so explain, you know, how you're using it in your practice. So uh, uh, again, I see the whole uh, patient's profile Mm -hmm. what spectrum of allergic conditions the person has. Uh, uh, Originally, when Zolaire came, uh, I used it uh, on my uh, patients with severe asthma, uh, and I had uh, very good results. But the limitation of um, Zolair is a um, uh, risk of anaphylaxis, which I've seen. You have seen that. I mean, oh, yeah. again, they because in the beginning, it's interesting. That was just so the listeners know, Zolair, which again, big promise as a, an amazing medication. There were reports of anaphylaxis, so patients typically had to wait like an hour, hour and a half in the office on the first one or two injections. Uh, after that, it was 30 minutes, typically like an allergy injection to wait. Uh, I mean, there's 20 years experience now. So I, I know that it's rare, but again, you said you've seen that. Because I mean, again, the big worry too was there was also, I believe, uh, delayed reactions of anaphylaxis, like even two hours later, which is obviously or very- Or two concerning. days later. Even two days later, I didn't know that, wow. Yeah. Okay, so you used oh, it with- yeah. Excuse me. And the other thing, it, it was one. Uh, and the other uh, is that uh, it was difficult to arrange the medication because people didn't fit to one asthma phenotype. And, uh, you know, what will you do with a patient uh, who has uh, uh, IgE, uh, total IgE of 6,000? Mm-hmm. Uh, potentially, this person should not get Zoller according to recommendations, right? So, and... Uh, but it, it was effective for these people. Right. And I had cases like this. And I used uh, a, a, a Zolair for a person with severe asthma, nasal polyps, and um, uh, many other <coughs> like um, uh, uh, types of allergy, like um, rhini- allergic rhinitis uh, and what are, uh, food allergies. And I used uh, Zolaire on him, and he had a uh, baseline uh, Ig of 6,000, uh, and it worked out. It was difficult to pre-approve, but uh, in general, that was a very good case. And by the way, after five years on the medication, uh, this guy does not need any biologics anymore. Well, that's a question I wanted to get to also. That's really interesting whether this has to be a lifetime medication. And why do you think that was? It was just that things got so controlled, you got you reversed the process. Just in your um thoughts, why do you why do you think he was able to stop? I'm not sure why. Mm-hmm. I mean, first of all, it's the, uh, he, we start stopped it not because of my oh, he, he but because not... of the COVID. COVID. <laughs> okay, that, that was a stopper. Uh, right. And uh, the uh, I watch him for two years already, and he doesn't need anything. He, the, he uses uh, only short steroid courses for uh, sinus infections, and mm. that's that, uh, mm-hmm. because he Did, has I'm curious too. You know, Zolaire was originally being uh, developed for food allergies, and there was a what happened was there was a big controversy. I think two companies were had a big patent fight, so. It never really came to fruition with the trials. I'm just curious, did you ever see that patients that you were treating with Zolaire, that their food allergies got better uh, while you were giving to them for their asthma if they happened to have both? Uh, you, you know, I had uh, I didn't have particular cases of uh, food allergies, but uh, oral allergy syndrome. You saw that get better? Did you see that oh. get better? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it did get better. Yeah. Okay. What about also Zolaire? It got recently approved in the last few years for... Uh, chronic urticaria, or you know, as the lay people may know as hives. Have you used it for that? And uh, have you seen, you know, because I tried it a few times early on, I didn't see successes with it. I, I use some other methods now that I think are very 
helpful, but uh, did you have any success using this for the chronic urticaria? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, for that, I have uh, several patients on it right now. And um, especially, I, I was <coughs> impressed by uh, cases uh, when people developed urticaria after COVID vaccines. Mm. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, uh, in general, the present, uh, it started from one case, which I had, uh, the uh, patient is a pediatric uh, psychiatrist and a very good clinician. So she was leading me through her symptoms very precisely. So, uh, and uh, I, I, she didn't respond to 10 antihistamines per day. Uh, oh. And uh, I needed to add Montelukas, I needed to add uh, a quercetin, and I start her uh, on steroids, of course, but I couldn't taper steroids off. So uh, in general, her labs revealed very high um, uh, urticaria index, uh, histamine re uh, release. Yeah, that's a blood and, test, right, for that, right. Mm -hmm. And also high level of tryptase and histamine. Oh. It, uh, when she was on antihistamines. So, and uh, uh, basically what's happened to my opinions, uh, she developed mast cell activation. Ab no, absolutely. Yeah, I just want to stop you. I, just for the listeners too, I myself too, my practice, I see a lot of mast cell activation cases, but there's definitely been an uptick after uh, getting COVID. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to get the COVID vaccinations. So these were people who probably had underlying mast cell, as you would say, genetic susceptibility to this problem. But I, I think what's just really interesting, unfortunately, COVID, the spike protein, seems to really uh, agitate mast cells, which we forgot, even in immunology, I always say this, I said, we missed the boat on this for many years. We thought mast cells were just these cells, oh, you don't really need, or they're just in allergy patients. This is a first line of defense. And I think COVID has opened our eyes how important these cells are, or what kind of problems they can cause when they are um, in constant activation. So yeah, that's a great point. Yes, and uh, actually one little comment. This uh, psychiatrist uh, had an uh, underlying condition. It's uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Oh, there's a and, big connection with those two also, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. people were left. Yeah. So, and probably this vaccine, as you uh, oh, yeah. say, that triggered uh, her uh, muscle disorder. So, and uh, <coughs> I uh, was able to, uh, put her in complete remission on wow. there. Okay, wow. And did you have to continue it or was you able to get, because, you know, again, it's interesting. I, I don't know the current uh, guidelines, but in the beginning, it was typically like three injections of Zolaire for chronic urticaria. I don't know if they've allowed expansion of that, that people can continue to get that, or is it still limited to just a few injections and it's either it works or it doesn't? No, it, it's chronic. It's a chronic use. I mean, what yeah. we, but I keep observing her. She still needs her antihistamines. I mean, we were able to decrease it to two pills per day, mm. but from 10. But uh, in general, she needs this medication all the time. We were able to immunize her to COVID again. So she's got the next uh, COVID vaccine because she has two uh, toddlers and she has uh, the husband with uh, uh, chronic uh, look, uh, CT, uh, lymphocytic. CLL. And, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. CLL. And uh, uh, so she decided that mm. she prioritizes their health. Uh, uh, but uh, when we tried to slow it down, uh, we were not able to do that. She needs to continue on, on Zolaire. Mm. And uh, now, actually, it's a, it's a big trend in allergy uh, for doctors who deal with um, uh, muscle activation syndrome, MCAS. Uh, they start patients on um, Zolaire. Really? Okay, yeah. I haven't heard that. And they're getting that approved? Because I know how hard it is to get that uh, medication. Yeah, but you know how we approve things. It's either for asthma or for, right. or for right. Or right, right, right. The, do the doctor's taking the, go, doing everything they can to get their patients. I, I have a patient like that with food allergies. I'm trying to um, get them approved for Zolaire because this person hasn't left their house in three years. It's a, it's a young teenager whose food allergies are so severe that he just can't go anywhere to eat without getting anaphylaxis. Uh, okay, let's move on because I want to get to some of the other conditions and medications to get all of your expertise. Now, let's go to atopic dermatitis or as in the layman terms, eczema. You know, it's a chronic skin condition that's really common. For many years, it frustrated dermatologists and allergists. 
similar to psoriasis. I mean, all the doctors could do was either prescribe steroid creams or antihistamines. And it was a, it was a really uncomfortable uh, existence for a lot of these patients. Now, there's an FDA-approved medication, Dupixent. And this seems to be a game changer. And the other really interesting thing about Dupixent, I wanted to ask you about, because I have a patient that was on it from her dermatologist that I was seeing for uh, food allergies. Um, she's allowed to self-administer it, which I, it surprised me because I know Zolaire, I believe, still has to be done in a doctor's office unless that's about to change. But, no, no, um, no. Uh, patients give it themselves. Now it's self-administered also, even though it's risk oh. of anaphylaxis. Interesting. Yeah. What, what do you, okay, so tell me a little bit about Dupixent. Um, it, it, it works differently than Zolaire. I mean, Zolaire, as you and I know, as immunologists, it blocks um, IgE in the free floating IgE in the system. Dupixent works differently. It, uh, it inhibits, um, I believe, is it interleukin 5? Yes, and it prevents eosinophil uh, formation. Right, <laughs> right, right. That's right. It, um, so, which is kind of interesting because I think also we never really, even as allergists, realized how important the eosinophils are to uh, um, eczema. We know we really wouldn't, weren't sure which cell is it. Is it the mast cell? Is it the IgE? You know, a lot of those patients have very elevated IgE, as, as you know. So, what's your experience in using Dupixent for uh, atopic dermatitis? Um, and uh, Again, when do you decide to use that with a patient versus just using, you know, topical creams? Uh, you know, uh, uh, frankly, right now I have a low threshold to start on it because it has very minimal side effect profile and uh, uh, the uh, efficacy is amazing. Mm. It really changes uh, pe people's lives. Uh, I uh, have... Uh, and especially, uh, as you know, we have people with what it's, uh, was called um, um, allergy march. So they right. have multiple uh, conditions and uh, 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 Dupixent is FDA approved for um, uh, atopic dermatitis, for uh, uh, eosinophilic asthma, for uh, nasal polyps. And for e e EOE, it was in the filicus of a jet. Yeah, the, you're, you're hitting the whole spectrum of things. Yeah, well, I was going to get to that. Uh, just quick question, though. Do, does it have an age range? I mean, are children allowed to get it? Or is there uh, only know, for I, adults? I uh, tr treat pe uh, pe uh, children only after age 12. Yes, and it's uh, approved for age. It's approved. You know, yeah. a lot of times sometimes the kids have really severe eczema. Yes, and um, I have I have one case when uh, a boy uh, was uh, uh, very... Uh, uh, had low per percentile in his height, in his weight. I mean, he was seeing uh, all specialists. He could not sleep. He was fatigued, uh, poor school performance. Uh, but uh, when I examined the boy, uh, all he had was just bad eczema, including his hands. And he was not able to uh, function. He uh, was not able to do any sports. He was not able to do mm. anything. So, and uh, I had, uh, I mean, I put him on all classical uh, treatment with antihistamines. Uh, to, uh, he was on topical uh, creams, uh, including tacrolimus, uh, and nothing was helping. He was on Montelukast and whatever. And the mom was very resistant uh, to start on Dupixent. Uh, and after uh, six months, finally, uh, we were fighting. So when we started him, uh, on this. In, uh, in a month, the boy came without any um, mm. skin disease. He started growing, he gained weight, mm. and he started sleeping, no fatigue, and his oh, wow. uh, performance uh, in school increased dramatically. So he's on it for uh, uh, three years now, wow. and he's a 100% healthy boy. Let me ask you this too. So, okay, two questions. Uh, one, with the children, for example, to are the parents administering the injection? Does a nurse have to come? Do the patients do it themselves? Is it that easy? I mean, children can do it uh, themselves. Uh, what, they inject in the thigh or something? Is that yeah, 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 it's easy. Yeah. But this boy had panic attacks, but uh, luckily his father is a podiatrist. And he's okay. a podiatrist. Right, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so everybody's finding somebody that they know that has some medical training. Okay. And just, which is interesting how you're describing this because this is three years and it sounds like a great case. And you haven't had any concerns or there didn't appear to be anything as far as any kind of side effects using the medication this long? 
you know, the major concern with uh, the pixent is um, uh, uh, eye complications, but uh, conjunctivitis. Right. right. Uh, luckily, he uh, didn't have it and he doesn't have it. And I have patients on uh, the pigs and other patients who stay on it for uh, five years or already and everything is fine. But I have one case uh, of a um, young woman with horrible uh, uh, atopic dermatitis uh, with uh, actually uh, the other um, complications. She has chronic st staphylococ uh, uh, staphylococcus carrier state. Yeah. And she has profound menos uh, binding lectin deficiency. So she gets infections. When we met, she was uh, on a number of medications uh, for this atopic dermatitis. Uh, she was on steroids, 40 milligrams a mm. day, and cell sept. And she was admitted to hospitals for IV antibiotics every month. Oh, wow. And still, uh, she needed 15 uh, antihistamines per day. When I started her on Dupixent, uh, she stopped going to the hospitals for uh, IV uh, um, antibiotics. We tapered off uh, all uh, uh, like steroids, immunosuppressants, everything was good. But she developed anaphylaxis to Dupixent. I've never heard about it. Mm, I guess it can happen, you know, again, and also you take something long enough. But you haven't seen, which is, I think is really important, and because as you mentioned earlier when in the introduction about, you know, dealing with patients with immunodeficiency or, uh, you know, and people putting them into immunodeficiency, treating them. Have you seen any immunodeficiency with some of these biologics? This was a concern to me because especially with COVID and flus, I mean, these medications have to be blocking down the immune system, obviously, to stop the allergic inflammation. Have you seen them more prone to in respiratory infections or, you know, any other type of infection due to being on these biologics no no you haven't no. seen that no 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 not uh, uh il5 not il13 no 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 okay well that's good again this is what i'm i'm drawing on your experience and using this a lot uh because again you know I, there are a lot of patients i see who are extremely resistant to considering these medications uh so all right and the last part on the allergy i want to get to because then i want to get to your other specialty but you know what i do find really fascinating because probably one of the most difficult patients i saw throughout my career who i felt bad for were the patients with chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps these are patients that could have really miserable ex existences they couldn't taste or smell their food their polyps would totally block up their nose. They would have multiple surgeries. I mean, they would be back to the E. And I had one doc, one patient, pretty much every year he was going to the ENT to have major nasal surgery to remove the polyps. And now with Dupixin, um, it seems like this is a real game changer. And uh, so I was just curious in your experience, again, too, are you, uh, are you, are the ENTs using this or are they do they refer them to you to give the, to pick, how, how is that working out in your relationship, what we were talking about earlier, connecting between specialties? Because ENTs and allergists sometimes get along, sometimes they're <laughs> enemies. I don't know, how do, how do you work with your colleagues? Like who's, who's in charge of that? Uh, I think it's the same as with pulmonologists for uh, prescribing uh, biologics for asthma. It's personal decision. Okay. Uh, so far in my practice, I see only one case when ENT doctor gave uh, put, uh, tried to give a uh, biologic drug for nasal polyps, but he wasn't successful. It's extremely difficult to pre approve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dude, it's, it's, it's hard to do it's what? To pre approve, to make pre approve. Oh, that's the, yeah, that's the big job. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. And uh, actually, uh, uh, you mentioned Dupixin for um, uh, nasal polyps, but also uh, Nucala. Is yes, you like Nucala? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in general, uh, Nucala is preferable because it's once a month compared to every two weeks. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, people are very sensitive, very uh, like princesses on the pee. They want to have uh, as uh, of less course. possible intervention. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in in general, um, I have patients um, um, 
uh, with uh, nasal polyps who start and actually Fazenra as well. Um, uh, I have uh, a case which uh, amazed me. Uh, I started one uh, patient uh, who uh, had wheezing every single day and she was using up to four times a day uh, rescue inhalers. Uh, she uh, could, I mean, uh, she could not smell. She um, has nasal voice when she comes you know this is a nasal pilot patient uh and i was uh, i'm doing um LG immunotherapy on her with uh environmental allergens and every time i was listening her lungs uh she needed to take um a inhaler before <coughs> For shots uh, for, uh, to prevent risk of uh, bronchospasm so she started on fazenra and next day she stopped using inhalers, uh, wow. inhalers. Now she sounds good. Uh, she's uh, two months on it, and uh, she uh, she does much much better. Uh, no risky inhalers since uh, the drug initiation. Much less uh, nasal symptoms, and uh, I don't see uh, I, I see shrinking polyps. So that's uh, how fast it can. So let me ask you on all these medications. You know, before we transition to autoimmune diseases. Is there a point though where you say let's stop for a few months and see if you don't need it? I um, mean, is, is there any way you have a guideline on that? I mean, if someone's extremely stable, see, they've, they've been off inhalers for a few months. Do you say let's not let's not you know you know let's not you know rock the the cradle kind of thing, or do you say let's stop and see maybe you don't need it? Is there you know I mean I'm sure patients stop sometimes on their own, or was there a time where you say I think we should take a break? Uh, you know, I don't have uh, uh, too long cases on these biologic drugs, uh, but uh, uh, I uh, and actually it's another phenomenon because, uh, because sometimes people are on one medication and it works and then um, they become tolerant. So okay. we need to switch, let's say, Fazenra mm -hmm. to Nucala or opposite mm -hmm. Nucala to mm -hmm. Fazenra. But uh, there is a, an important phenomenon to know about. And the other thing, I never stop. I Nobody taught me how to do it in allergy, but I use the same technique as I use in rheumatology. So I uh, uh, it prolong, uh, I extend um, um, medication timing. So instead of, let's say, two weeks, uh, two weeks and uh, two days. So, and I extend it by day by day. It's how uh, we recommend uh, to do for medications for um, inflammatory arthritis, let's say. Interesting. Not, not even like, to, like let's do it, uh, not every two weeks, but uh, every month. Mm -hmm. But I extend day by day to see how patients do. And patients give you limitations. Uh, they say, oh, you know, I couldn't do more than right. this. Do you also find, too, if patients start, let's say they do better and on their own they stop, or for whatever reason something comes up, if they got COVID, God forbid, if they wait if, and if several months interval, is it is the medicine, again, usually effective, or is there a problem if you have to restart when you've had a break from the medication? Uh, it varies. Mm -hmm. It varies. And now I have a very... An interesting in case I, I cannot say much about it uh i have a patient uh, who came for the first consult and she uh, was treated for uh, atopic dermatitis with uh, the pixent and then uh, they couldn't use it uh, because of the uh, covid and insurance issues and so when uh, her doctor restarted it she developed severe um, uh, photosensitive rash after the pixent it's not listed anywhere. I did mm -hmm. my research and her doctor, uh, dermatologist did the research. Nobody uh, found anything. And now uh, we are uh, facing some new phenomenon. I mean, she responds to the medication with the atopic dermatitis, but not as uh, much as before, after this uh, six months or a year of break. Uh, and she has this new phenomenon of, of photosensitivity. Mm, interesting. So, that I, that One other question too, I don't know if you do, I mean, you're busy doing so many things. Do you do algae immunotherapy in your practice? And do you see the role of that still with some of these medications, like for asthma, for example, or yeah, rhinitis? So you do use yeah. it, hoping, yeah. yeah, hoping to help sort of change the, what we call the TH2 response 
and you know get built up immune tolerance so if a patient has if a person is allergic to their cats and you know dogs this is what i see all the time because i do sublingual drops where i desensitize patients i've been really successful at doing that for many years now but again people can use allergy injections as well but do you find again if you're treating the underlying specific allergy like that that even if they have severe asthma or eczema that maybe the, by doing the immunotherapy, you can eventually get rid of both medications or treatments. Yeah, I, I hope so. Uh, I have uh, a few cases I do parallel. And by the way, the guy who was on Zolaire, uh, and uh, uh, we stopped it by the situation uh, with the COVID pandemic, uh, he also was on uh, AIT uh, for several years mm -hmm. and also needed to stop that as well. And you see no, no asthma rebound. Really okay. nice. Okay. Let's transition to the other area because, again, you know, it's interesting in allergy fellowships here in the United States, they, there is, um, depending on the department, certain uh, areas of focus. So, for example, like my the place where I trained at St. Luke's Roosevelt, which is now Mount Sinai West, <laughs> uh, our our real focus at the time I was training was not only allergies, but it was infectious diseases and immunology. We were actually a big AIDS center. So in my training, I got a lot of infectious disease. I mean, for several months out of the year, I was on call, you know, consulting on the infectious disease service, which was really interesting. It really added a lot to my, my background besides just doing algae. And I know in your, uh, I guess, fellowship and training, it was probably rheumatology, you know, more than infectious disease. And some, in some places like Columbia, it's rheumatology and uh, pulmonary, which is great because I think the more you experience you get during those type of years is fantastic. So I want to ask you about this. You know, autoimmune in, in the area of autoimmune diseases, biologics really appears to be a game changer. The older medications, as we mentioned, typically prednisone, like oral cortisone, methotrexate, plaquenil, all had some you know limited benefits, but a lot of long term side effects. I mean, it was really horrendous, and patients really hated being on them. Do you find that the biologics meet what they claim to do, like for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, where they actually halt joint destruction and, you know, are really, are they first line? I mean, are these medications, as you mentioned, like methotrexate, um, Plaquenil, are they, you know, can the biologics be first line? You know, because I've never really seen anymore, you know, typically in medical journals, they have like like with hypertension, first line medication, second line, third line. Do we have this now in rheumatology? And, and what's your experience in uh, using these, um, you know, in selecting these medications? <clears throat> yes, of course. Uh, the, there is a, a stepwise approach uh, and uh, it's both recommended <laughs> um, um, from the medical perspective and uh, the other thing is financial perspective because uh, let's say uh, uh, as you uh, said uh, metric state is the first line uh, uh, therapy for uh, for a any inflammatory arthritis actually uh, psoriatic rheumatoid and um, um, for uh, lupus uh, and uh, what I learned if I don't use it I I'm not able to get through pre-approval of any biologic drug by insurance company. Okay, so what you're saying, I just want to make this clear to the listeners, and this is like disappointing, and one of my upcoming podcasts is going to be about health insurance with a very unique new way of doing it, because this is quite upsetting. So basically you're saying a patient has to go on methotrexate or Plaquenil before the insurance company will say, oh, it's okay, you didn't do well enough on this, you have to go to, you can now go, you know, get go to one of the biologics although the biologics might be in some ways what you're telling me a safer less side effects more effective treatment is is that can i say that's correct that's correct and uh but uh metrixate actually has a very interesting quality um and we like to use it together with tna blockers or other uh biologics uh, and it's a metrixate side effect it uh is consistent of uh, prevention of anti-drug antibody formation. Okay. You see, like, like let's say when we give um, uh, vaccines to patients on metric aid, uh, we request them to hold off metric aid for two weeks uh, after, uh, um, uh, let's say, they got flu vaccine or COVID vaccine because 
the immune system uh, does not give a vigorous response right. uh, to produce antibodies. But we use this side effect of metrixate for um, biologic drugs. So uh, as I mentioned uh, be uh, before, uh, people develop tolerance to uh, biologic drugs after a while. Uh, and what, what do you think that is, by the way? Do you have any thoughts on why that happens? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's anti, uh, it's associated with anti-drug antibody formation because there are large molecules. Basically, they are foreign proteins, foreign uh, immunoglobulins. And the longer we use them, uh, the more immune system uh, works against them. And uh, every drug has its own quality. I mean, how much... Uh, uh, or the antibody response. Uh, is it uh, almost like what, like an IgG4 blocking antibody? Almost absolutely. Like what we do. So it's yeah. like what we do with allergy immunotherapy. We're trying to do that with a natural substance, you know, with the extracts induce that. But essentially what you're saying is when you keep on giving these biologics, you're also doing that. Okay. Yeah, and in mm -hmm. fact, you can measure them. I, we don't do it routinely uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the patient uh, patients get stuck with the uh, bills for that. But uh, uh, GI uh, doctors who give um, uh, certain uh, like TNF blockers for ulcerative colitis or for Crohn's disease, they do measure it. Uh, and you can see antibody uh, or anti-drug antibody race, and they need to stop uh, the medication at some point. We don't use it routinely, but what we do, we start patients on metrixate and uh, we uh, add uh, a biologic drug. And the <clears throat> difference is uh, the majority of patients uh, have uh, to developed tolerance to um uh, biologic drugs within first uh, three, four years. But with metric eight, they can keep going. Uh, I have patients who are on so they, so they need both. Is it in a lot of these cases, you're saying, so it's not like they are just on the biologic, and that's something I didn't know. A lot of them need to be on the methotrexate as well. Because that one, as you know, has some liver toxicity. Sometimes patients, you know, have experienced other side effects, which you're- And risk working. for cancers. What's and that? Risk can and risk for cancers. For methotrexate? Yeah, of course. Really? I thought they use it to treat cancers. Yes, but also it risks, uh, there is a risk for uh, skin cancers and uh, really? wow. for renal cancer. So it, it does exist. Wow. We use small doses, but uh, you, you never know. But in any event, uh, it, it depends uh, on the case. Many people just refuse to take it. Right. Uh, and I understand them. I don't force. If they respond very well to biologic, I keep them on biologic only. The other uh, category is young uh, women who uh, are family planning. Of course, I don't give them metric aid. I uh, give like, let's say, for a week or two, and then I say whatever patient didn't tolerate, and I move on on biologic drugs. Okay, well, that's a great point. Let's just focus on that for a second. There are, unfortunately, a lot of young women that uh, have developed autoimmune diseases or have autoimmune diseases and still want to get pregnant. Um, what's the situation there? Do you have to start with the methotrexate or can you try to appeal to the insurance company saying, look, I think this could be potentially dangerous to their, you know, um, if they try to get pregnant, that they're better off just using the biologic and are the biologics, biologics safer? I mean, do they, I don't know if they have a rating in pregnancy, you know, like the category A, B or C, but uh, how does that work? Uh, they are natural uh, immunoglobulins. They're so, so, they, so, they, so they're not a rated yeah. as, as category A, B or C. And do you find you have a problem? Like if you went to, if you know, say you have a patient that became pregnant that had rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or Sjogren's, and it was not being well controlled, do you, again, do you have to, you know, are you able to bypass the methotrexate and get approval yes. from the insurance I mean, company? In these cases, I do. Yeah. I uh, write letters and so And uh, uh, But there are absolutely no contraindications. I have uh, many patients who got pregnant on uh, TNF blockers and they did really well no problems. But uh, there is another uh, uh, phenomenon which is very important to know that uh, uh, pregnancy, as you know, is uh, 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 increase, increases uh, allergic conditions, right? Right. But uh, rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis go to remission. You know, that's so fascinating uh, you say that because <laughs> I was reading a book uh, on this man, Bernie Marcus, who's one of the founders of Home Depot. He's a multi-billionaire. 
and uh, he does amazing philanthropic work, and he just had a book that was published. But the one of the things that caught my attention early on in the book was that he said he wasn't supposed to be born. And I said, what does that mean? His mother had two children already. She had, this was back in the, I guess, 40s or 50s, debilitating rheumatoid arthritis. And her doctor said to her, he goes, the only thing that's going to save you is to get, try to get pregnant again. And so she got pregnant and had him. And, you know, he obviously changed the world. But so, so that's fascinating. So pregnancy actually can be beneficial to some of these autoimmune conditions. Yes, yes, yes. But it's the same as graft versus host disease. Mm -hmm. and as you know, that uh, to prevent uh, 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 rejection uh, uh, of the transplant, uh, immune system switches to TH2 response. Mm -hmm. And mm. pregnancy, it's a sort of graft for a uh, material yes, graft. that's right, right. Uh, and uh, 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 thus, uh, it increases the risk of that, but TH1 response goes down. Okay. Let me ask you this too. There are, you know, when you watch on television, <laughs> there are a lot of these drugs that know. Humira, Enbril, Skyrizzi. I, I can't even keep track. I mean, I'm sure. How do you decide? I mean, do you have a... Um, you know, it's, sometimes it seems almost like blood pressure medicines, eeny, meeny, miny, mo kind of thing. Is there, do you, um, is there a certain like criteria selection when you're deciding on which me of these medications to use? And obviously based on, because, you know, a lot of these arthritic conditions seem to overlap. The rheumatoid arthritis with psoriatic arthritis, you know, because a lot of them, as you know, don't always have um, antibody markers in the blood anymore. It's just, it's a confusing state. I, we, I wish... You know, my, my, in my area of immunology, and I was working with an expert out in California with, for COVID, I was hoping cytokines, you know, an analysis would give us an answer, like how to target, you know, patients with certain medications. And unfortunately, I've been a little bit disappointed in that area. But how do you decide, you know, I mean, we see Phil Mickelson, I believe, I'm probably getting this wrong. I think he... I think he does Embril, you know, the golfer. I mean, he was like had debilitating psoriatic arthritis and now he was back winning golf championships at 50. And, uh, you know, and there are a lot of, I know, tennis players, young women tennis players um, that are, were diagnosed with, I think, Venus Williams and um, uh, I forgot the other name, the other, uh, Carolina Wozinski, I believe, also. So how how do you how would you select if one of these women came to you or the patients you see in your practice which uh, biologic to choose for these you know uh, arthritis conditions uh, you know uh, first of all uh, insurance companies leads your choice leave oh, your choice that's that's so, sad to hear but I, I i believe what you're saying because you're you're telling it straight okay and and why is that they say okay for rheumatoid arthritis this is the cheaper medication. That's why you should yeah, try it first. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. I give you the list of uh, uh, medications which are uh, level one, level, you know, eight. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that is one part. The other part, um, uh, you know, for a pregnancy, I always recommend uh, Simzia. It's the best medication because... Which one is this? Simzia. Simzia. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, sertalizumab or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this is the, it has, uh, it's a TNF blocker with the largest molecule. It doesn't cross placenta. Ah, interesting. Okay. So all, the, all of them are safe. Uh, mm -hmm. but this is number one uh, for uh, women to be uh, uh, calm about their pregnancy. So, uh, uh, by the way, what you said, I mean, you have such a scientific mind, how to predict which medication to give. Uh, there is a test now. Uh, it's new on the market. Frankly, I uh, didn't use it yet, but uh, it's for rheumatoid. It's called PRISM. So this is a um, um, uh, very complex test which predicts efficacy of TNF blockers. Oh, wow. What, yes. I'm sorry, how do you spell that? Prism. Oh, prism. Prism. Prism, mm -hmm. like a prism. And this test gives you, from the patient's blood, gives you an idea That's of correct. what medicine would hopefully target and work the best? No, uh, it will tell if TNF blockers will be effective or not. So oh. oh, okay. To escape uh, extra step if it's not needed. Mm -hmm. And all of these medicines I mentioned before, Humira, Embril, those are all TNF blockers, yes, correct? Yes, yes, 
Yeah. Where, uh, you know, before we tried one, then we tried another mm. one. If someone has allergy to, to one, allergic reactions to one, which are quite common, uh, we can switch to another uh, medication from this group. But if they didn't respond well to TNF blocker, uh, with the whole spectrum of new medications we, which we have on the market now, I never go to the second one. Uh, you know, uh, I prefer to use uh, not um, biologic uh, second uh, to uh, TNA blockers, but uh, also high tech molecule, but it's oral medication, small molecule, uh, 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 jack inhibitors. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I use that. And then I start playing with other medications. Uh, uh, like Orancia, uh, which um, blocks uh, uh, T cell communication, uh, or uh, I use uh, IL 17, IL 23 inhibitor, depends on the. I system. have to ask you this because this is, I mean, your, your doctor's bag of medications that you're familiar with is tremendous. I mean, I knew that. I, I knew that about you because we had to talk before. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up now, because I know myself as a physician, I am extremely cautious when there's new medications coming out. I just, I, you know, and I think doctors are like that a little bit in general, because you want to get the feel, you know, you can, I mean, you can get a drug rec can come in or you can, you know, be, you know, um, get, you know, you could see, you know, journal papers, you know, on articles, oh, this works for this. But till we do it, till you jump in the lake, literally, um, it's a big step for a doctor because we all like that. We all have our comfort zones and things that we're familiar with. I'm just curious for, for you as a physician, how do you handle juggling all these different medications and feeling comfortable with it? I'm just, I'm curious that from a, as a doctor point of view. Uh, I, I agree with you. I uh, uh, almost never use new medications right away. I wait. Yes. But if it's a known group of medications, uh, uh, I, a new medication came up, then I'm more um, uh, flexible with this. Uh, okay. So uh, let's say IL-17 inhibitors are very, very good uh, in terms of a side effect profile. Uh, I have um, uh, patients with, uh, you know, complications uh, for the bone marrow. I, uh, let's say I, I have one guy with uh, severe uh, psoriatic arthritis who has MDS, which started after use of TNF blockers. Oh, wow. He, mm -hmm. Yes, he came to me. Uh, with this condition, his white count is max uh, 1.9. Mm. And, uh, you know, when I, and he had uh, f three, four in, um, inflamed large joints, uh, the other doctor before me put him on Plaquenil, uh, which is not effective on psoriatic arthritis. Uh, he was on 15 milligrams of prednisone a day, and uh, uh, we needed to drain his knees uh, every couple of months. So that was his baseline condition. And uh, when uh, IL-17s came to the market, uh, uh, the best is Cosentix for the, such a situation because it doesn't affect white count. I mean, TALS is from the same group, but it's uh, it can affect uh, uh, white blood cells. Uh, uh, Cosentix does not. I always work together with their uh, uh, specialists. I mean, I spoke with the hematologist who was handling his case, and we agreed that we will try Cosentix. I'm but, sorry, what, what were you using Cosentix for what, his rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis? Sorry. You know, so the last thing I want to get to, uh, Dr. Belostotsky is getting back to your Russian roots. Uh, I've met several Russian and Eastern European doctors that have had a strong inclination to use natural treatments uh, using herbs such as ginger and turmeric to help in relieving arthritis inflammation. So I was interested in your uh, take on using uh, these kind of herbs and using fish oils and whether diet plays a role, you know, such as avoiding gluten or red meat. Um, unfortunately for my listeners, Dr. Belskotsky got cut off on this part. So I'm going to just paraphrase what she said was that, which I agree, you know, we're both, uh, conventional physicians, you know, though I do also do alternative medicine. And if you have severe disease, you really have to go with a conventional treatment to get it under control. Using the natural therapies is fine in conjunction with that, but don't make the mistake of, uh, getting worsening disease when there's such amazing new treatments that are available. Um, in concluding, I, I want to thank again Dr. Belostowski for taking the time to uh, teach all of us about these really important new medications 
that are really game changers. And to my listeners, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and let us know what you think. Take care and see you next time.